It is Easter. And we are glad that you are here with us this morning. Because we don't serve death. And because of Easter, we don't fear death. All death is is simply us falling asleep on this earth and getting rid of these nasty, wretched, broken down bodies Amen. and getting a new body with no problems. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love uh, this story. There was a little boy who was sitting next to his friend at church one Easter morning and his friend asked, how did you get that bruise on your arm? The boy replied, I ate some Easter candy. His friend said, Easter candy won't give you a bruise. <clears throat> well, it will if it's your brother's candy. <laughs> You've got to be careful what you take. There's also another story about two brothers who uh, were getting ready to boil some eggs to color for Easter. And I thought of you, Tim, <laughs> yesterday. Uh, I love this said that it's just like brothers. Uh, the older one said, I will give you $10 if you let me break three of these on your head. Yeah, leave it to boys. Uh, the younger one said, promise? Promise. So gleefully, the older brother broke the first egg over his brother's head. Then another one. The younger brother braced himself for the last egg, but nothing Ain't you going to break the third egg? The boy asked. The brother replied, Nah, if I did that, I'd owe you the $10. Mm -hmm. Life is full of promises. <clears throat> Life is full of promises that get broken. Life is full of words. It's all talk. No action. And this morning, we're going to look at something quite different. Because when God makes a promise, he doesn't break it. When God says he's going to do something, he does it. And he does it in ways that nobody else could ever do. We've been looking at Jesus on the cross and one of the things that we see with Jesus being the Messiah is that he fulfilled hundreds of prophecies. Statistically, mathematically, it is near impossible for one person to fulfill five prophecies. Just five. It is impossible to fulfill 15. But Christ fulfilled over 150 prophecies concerning his death alone. When God says he's going to do something, he does it. So when the world promises us something and lets us down, don't worry. They're not God. Because we serve a God who does not break promises. You know, we're, we just celebrated the one year anniversary of 15 days till the, we get over the curve. Now we're looking at four new strands of vaccines don't even touch so we could go another two years in this fear. But see, all this is is just getting our hearts right with God. So this Easter, I want us to look at, because the world gives us full of empty promises, I want us to look at three empty things this morning. The first thing I want us to look at is the empty cross.
You know what I see missing from this cross behind me? There's no person hanging there. A lot of people like wearing the little crucifixes and if you've got to have a cross around your neck so that you know that God loves you, you've got more issues than wearing a necklace. But the thing that really bugs me about them is that they wear them with Jesus on the cross. I don't see no body hanging from that cross. I mean, Scripture flat out tells you, but Jewish law even tells you that a body cannot be on a cross during Sabbath. It has to come down. That's why they broke the other two criminals' legs so that they could get to the death so they could get them off the cross before the sun sat and entered into Sabbath. Jesus was dead. He was off the cross. Now, if he got a cross, that's one thing. You don't have Jesus hanging on it. He ain't there anymore. He's alive. He's not on a cross. But if we return to the scene of Jesus' execution, we see the relics. You see the crown of thorns that were woven together and forcibly shoved down onto the skull of Christ. You see the nails. The custom says were about nine inches. Hence the, the rock band, nine inch nails. But they weren't just driven in. They would go on the back side of the cross and bend them so that you couldn't just pull it out. Somebody tried to rip you down from the cross, they'd shatter everything in your arm pulling those nails through. The nails are there. The crown's there. The hammer that was used is there. An empty cross tinged red with the blood of God. It's strange. It's bizarre. It's odd. We think about it and we're like, no, 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 no. It was man's blood. No. It was God's blood that ran down the cross. Yes, Jesus was fully man. He was tempted in every single way that you and I have been. He was tempted with lust. At one point in time, Jesus was teaching and they brought a woman who was caught and it says, in the very act of adultery. That means they brought her straight to Jesus, pulled her out of the bed and took her straight to Jesus. Guess what they didn't stop to do? So they throw this woman naked, showing her shame. Of course, under Jewish law, the man was supposed to be right there with her. Which shows that this was a setup. But naked woman thrown in front of a single man. How many of us honestly, and you women, if it was a naked man, who was good looking, how many of you could honestly say you wouldn't give it a look? I can't raise my hand and say that. I mean, it's a naked woman. Doesn't mean I love my wife any less. But there's a naked person in front of you it's kind of hard not to look he was tempted just like we are he was hungry out in the desert he'd been there for 40 days and Satan came to him and tempted him and said all you have to do is cast these say to these stones turn into bread and you've got food to eat When was the last time that you were so hungry that you were willing to eat just about anything? See, here's the thing. There is not a single thing that we ever will go through in our lives that Jesus hasn't experienced. He was fully man. But he never stopped being fully God. And so when he was stretched out and dying on the cross for our sins, he was 
God bleeding for you and for me to take away our sins. He died for our lies, for our jealousy, for our anger, for our betrayal. Our sins, our long list of sins. But see, that's what I want us to see. It's an empty cross. Our sins aren't there anymore either. Not only is Jesus not on the cross, our sins aren't on the cross anymore because his blood washed them away. We are forgiven. Whatever your sin is, it held him there. We just kept on racking up a bill. You lied. ka -ching. You stole. ka -ching. You didn't obey your parents, even when you're adults. ka -ching. You didn't love your neighbor as yourself. ka -ching. You got mad at somebody driving down the road. Ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. Yep. <laughs> we have this long list. And because of that list, there's a payment that is required. Romans 6.23 says, The payment for sin is death. Bum, bum, bum. That's it. There is no wiggle room. Death is required because you are horrible and despicable. And you have sinned. But don't feel too bad. So am I. And so am I. We're all despicable, worthless, no good for nothing, worthless, unable to pay the penalty of our sin. But Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, you were dead in sins. And your sinful desires were not yet cut away. Then, 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 he, Jesus, gave you a share in the very life of Christ. For he forgave all your sins and blotted out the charges proved against you. The judge found you guilty and sentenced to death, but Christ's blood wiped those charges away. You know, those charges that were against you, the list of his commands which you had not obeyed, he took this list of sins and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. And there it was. God paid your penalty. What? God? The creator of the universe dies? What kind of warped story is this? That's why John Wayne rarely ever died in a movie. The hero doesn't die. Don't worry, don't worry. He ain't all dead. He just sick. The empty cross promises forgiveness. Because John 19.30 tells us that after six hours of hanging on the cross, he cries out, it is finished. In the Greek, he uses the word telestai, which means an accounting word that says paid in so when he screams out it is finished he is saying your sin debt is paid in full 
We have an empty cross to celebrate. That's that old song we grew up hearing. He paid a debt he didn't know. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid our debt. And this morning, we are so thankful and so blessed that we serve a God of an empty cross. But that's not the only thing that is empty. We have empty clothes. Empty clothes. Joseph of Arimathea was a Pharisee secretly following Jesus Christ. Him and Nicodemus. From all accounts after the resurrection of Christ, they never associated with that lifestyle again. They never hid their belief. They never hid their faith. But Joseph went to Pilate and begged for the body of Christ. And Nicodemus came and they wrapped his body in burial clothes, long strips of linen. And in John chapter 19, verse 40, it says, following Jewish burial customs, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. One gospel account says 75 pounds of spices. They didn't have embalming fluid back then. So they would pour spices on top of the body. Okay, this is important. I want you to grasp this. 75 pounds of spices. That's a lot of weight. That's what? That's seven bags of potatoes and then another five pound bag. So seven and a half bags of potatoes laying on top of you. And, and, and Remember, you have had nails in your hands and your feet, a spear thrust through your side, your back split open, and you, you just fell asleep and woke up, shoved all that off, and walked out from the grave. He was a special kind of stupid. And you say you don't have enough faith to believe that Jesus did what he said he did. Uh, you've got to have more faith to believe that nonsense than to believe that Jesus did what he said he did. But these aren't just a sheet that we fold you up in. It says long linen strips. Strips. Like the mummies. Wrapped. And you're crossed over. I'm not sure exactly how in the world I'm supposed to get undone in this. This was the harsh, love me long time jackets. They wrapped him up. And John saw this. Remember, John is at the foot of the cross. And he sees them wrap Jesus up. Inside of those Close was who was supposed to be the Redeemer. Who was supposed to be the Messiah. Who was supposed to be our Savior. Who was supposed to be God. Who was supposed to be everything. It was all a supposed to be because he's dead. He's shoved into a, to a cold grave. He's dead. It takes multiple soldiers to roll this stone in a tight groove in place. He's dead. In fear that the disciples would come and secretly steal his body, Pilate put a seal over the tomb 
and anyone who touches, not just moves or does anything to it, touches the grave will be executed on the spot. And then puts a centurion guards in front. Probably 20 to 30 guards. Armed guards. He's dead. It's over. All our hopes, all our dreams, all our goals, all our wishes, everything that Jesus taught was over. It was a lie. Because there is Jesus wrapped in clothes, lying in a grave, wrapped tightly, sealed up. It's dark, it's cold, it's damp. He's dead. Or is he? Because something happened. We don't know what took place on that Saturday. But we know they were gathered together in an upper room. Most believe it was the same upper room that they had just celebrated Passover in. And all of a sudden, about daybreak, because it wasn't just a, I mean, it's a pounding on the door. Of course, they're already thinking they're coming for us. It's over. Look out and it's Mary. Mary Magdalene. It opens up the door to let her in, and before the door can fully get open, she is screaming out, He's alive! He's alive! I've seen Jesus! He's alive! And they're like, Yeah, you are smoking something. Because <laughs> we saw him dead, we saw him wrapped, we saw him sealed. You don't come back from that. This ain't Lazarus 2.0. He ain't dead and gone. But it says that they ran to the tomb. Peter and John ran to the tomb. John outran Peter and he went into the tomb. And John tells us in chapter 20, verse 9, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They're sitting here looking at this. They're looking at the empty clothes. They don't get it. And here, we jump a couple of verses back to verse 5. He says that he, John, stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. If somebody stole a body, they're going to take the whole thing. And if you did come back alive, you're trying to get out. You're not going to spend time Wrapping it up, folding it up real nice, and then coming over here to the head scarf and wrapping it up and folding it up real nice. That's not how that works. See, here's the thing. Jesus wasn't so. The reason why the clothes were empty is because he had resurrected. He is a life. We don't serve a dead Savior. We don't serve a Savior that's still in grave clothes. John's mind began to race. Someone stole the body. Wouldn't they have taken the clothes too? Why waste time unwrapping the body? Something had to have happened. The empty clothes show faith. All there is is empty clothes. But we need to know that when doubts or fears well up inside, when our faith is shaken, when we seem to have lost all hope, 
Don't leave God. Linger near Him. Because here's the secret. There's empty clothes that are waiting for you. Because us who are dead have grave clothes. But when Jesus resurrects us, those grave clothes will be empty. Because they will be empty. So we've seen the power of the empty cross. We've seen the power of the empty clothes. <laughs> but now it gets really good. This is what gets you excited. This is what makes today so great. Because we don't serve a dead guy on a piece of wood. We don't serve a dead guy that's inside of grave clothes. And we don't serve a guy who's sitting in a grave because there is an empty cave. It is empty today. That's why we started the service out by saying, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Because he is alive. Amen. The tomb in which Jesus was laid to rest belonged to Joseph. It was a newly carved crypt cut into the side of a rock wall that nobody, nobody had even used before. Heard a story uh, that one of Joseph's friends pulled him aside and said, Joseph, that was such a beautiful, costly, hand-hewn tomb. Why on earth did you give it to someone else to be buried in? Joseph just smiled and said, why not? He only needed it for the weekend. <laughs> but see, it was so powerful, Joseph went and made another tomb. Because you can still go to that tomb today. And it's still empty. Last year, because of COVID, no one was able to go to the grave. This year, more than any other year in recent history, people have lined up to see the tomb that gives us hope. That no matter how bad this world gets, God is bigger and God is greater. Because he is that's where it gets really good. Because when they were there, when the women went, there was an earthquake. All the soldiers, Scripture says, fell as dead men. And the angels came, rolled the stone away. And that's where we pick up in Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 and 6. And he says, the angel says, don't be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. He has risen from the dead as he said he would. And then, then here it is. Come and see the place where the body was. To come see that it is empty. And then that's where they ran back to tell the disciples. The tomb of Jesus remained empty. It still remains empty as a symbol that life that outlasts the grave, that life everlasting. We have hope. We have peace. We have strength because the tomb is empty. And I know this seems a little strange because we talked about three empty things. But the empty cross, the empty grave, the empty cave all show us one important thing. That God's promises are not empty. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. And what he says he will do he will do. 
period. You don't get any better than that. Our minds can hardly grasp this concept that there is more to life. That God gives us a promise because he rose from the grave. We see that in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that's you and me, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life because Jesus rose from the grave. We can have life everlasting. That's what he told Nicodemus, the woman at the well who had been married four times and was checking up with somebody else. They had a horrible past that nobody wanted to associate with her. She had to come at the heat of the day because even the other women didn't want to be around her. You know, guilty by association. But this is what Jesus told her in John chapter 4, verse 14. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them, there it is again, eternal life. Amen. See, we have a God who loves us in spite of us. Who loves us no matter how bad we mess up, how, no matter how bad we screw up, no matter how bad our past is. No matter how bad we're going to mess up in the future, we have a God who loves us. And because of the empty cross, because of the empty grave clothes, because of the empty cave, we have a God who loves us enough to forgive us of all of that, to cleanse us and make us new again. That's why he told the crowd in John chapter 6, verse 47, I tell you the truth that anyone, there's no condition there, just the ones who are good. Just the ones who give enough money. Now, anyone who believes has eternal life. See, it's that simple. We just come to Him. That's where it all is about. The promise of the eternal life comes because of the heartbeat of hope in Jesus Christ. He offers forever. He offers eternity. It's what we as Christians long and look forward to. It's what gets us through those 24-hour days, those seven days a week, those 12 months of a year, the years and years years that we have on this earth. Because of the promise of eternal life, we have an unspeakable hope and a bubble of delight and joy that flows within us and out of us because of the emptiness of Easter. Because at the cross, the clothes, and the cave are empty. We know that God will keep All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God said to the serpent, the seed of the woman will crush your head. Fast forward. Satan thought he won the battle. Jesus said, it is finished. Poor fool. He just opened up a can of worms. He couldn't even handle it. Because of that early, that third day, when the stone rolled away, while all heaven rejoiced, all hell screamed in misery. That Satan had getting stopped. 
death has no power. Death has no sting. For a believer, there's life and there's glorious life. But for those who don't know Christ, there's life and everlasting place that was very real and very horrible in a place called hell that was never designed for humans. It was created for Satan and his followers. And that was it. And contrary to what a lot of people believe, God does not send anyone to hell. He paved the way with the cross, the clothes, and the cave to keep us from going there. We have, as Robert Frost said in his poem, that I came to a fork in the road. We have a choice to make. Do we choose the safe and easy way? Do it our way. Make the world happy. Or do we choose the straight and narrow path? The one less trodden. The one that few find. One leads to eternal damnation and destruction and torture and horrendous suffering. Because you are eternally separated from the God of love who loves you so much that he gave you his son. Or do we choose that straight and narrow that leads to the arms of a loving father? And as he said at the end of his poem, I choose the one less taken. And it's made all. For a believer, choosing Christ is the only hope we have in a hopeless and fallen world. When life falls to pieces, knowing Christ gives us meaning. This morning I saw in the paper, and I told my mom, I don't get it. This is one of the things I just I can't wait to get to heaven to figure it out. Because there was a, a one-year-old, one-month baby that had died. After a five-month battle with leukemia. I'll never understand why God would allow parents to have a child just to snap away. It doesn't make sense. But in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of that pain, here's what we know. God is the only hope, the only peace, and the only comfort in that situation. You're 80, 90 years old and you die. God's the only hope, peace, and comfort in that situation. You're going through a sickness. You lost a job. You're struggling financially. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. God is your only hope, peace, and comfort in that situation. And it's only because he proved himself to be faithful and true. And when he promises to do something, we know that he will fulfill his promise because there's an empty grave, an empty grave clothes, and an empty cross. He is alive. Because of his promise, we are heading for forever. Why well, Paul tells us in Romans 6, 8 through 10, and since we died with Christ, that's when we accepted Jesus as our Savior, we die to ourselves. Since we've died with Christ, 
we know we will also live with him. Here's how we can be sure of that. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. He is alive. He is alive forevermore. As Edwin Excel put in the final verse of Amazing Grace. When we've been there 10,000 years. Bright shining as We've no less days to sing his praise than when we first beheld him. The empty cross. It's empty. It's gruesome. It's bloody. But it shows the promise of forgiveness of all of our sins. The empty clothes. Folded to show that he was not taken. The promise of faith for those who stay close to God during these dark days. And the empty cave promises forever to those who put their faith in the one who has conquered death. God is a God of promise. He is a God of life. Not death. He gives you the choice to choose Him or choose the world. But you can't have both. This morning, as we celebrate the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior, what better way to truly say thank you for the blood that we sang about. So we're going to sing about in just a little bit about the amazing love of Christ. What better way to say thank you than to come to him and say thank you, forgive me. Wash me clean. I want to be your child. Above all others, I choose you. I guarantee you, if you make that choice today, for him to be your Lord and Savior, to pay your sin debt, we'll have the best Easter you've ever had in your life. And no Easter bunny, no Easter eggs, no good eating after church or having fun with our family will even come close to comparing to the goodness, to the richness, to the happiness we will have knowing that this Easter you too have risen again. Let's pray. God, Thank you for the cross where you forgave us. Thank you for setting us free, for making us whole. Thank you for the grave clothes that were empty, the promise that you are near to us when we draw near to you to embrace you, to hold you. And we worship you for the empty cave. Because if you had not risen from the grave, today would just be any other day. And there would be no magic 
no wonder, no celebration in Christmas without your resurrection. For you would have just been another baby boy. another person to God. But thank you for being so much more. For loving us and saving us. We ask that you forgive us where we have sinned against you. Where we have sinned against others. Wash us clean today. Make us new. Make us whole. Make us alive again. Be our Lord and our Savior. And we will praise you and you alone. For you are worthy. Stand as we sing our invitation this morning.